March 5th, 2008, had the earmarks of something big happening at Glen Canyon Dam. All matter of government officials and honored guests were there. The media was there. Even some curious feathered friends flew in to take a look. All were drawn to this remote corner of northeastern Arizona to watch the keepers of the dam try to recreate what nature had taken care of for centuries, flooding the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. No longer does the Colorado yield its greatest force against the rock, the power of floodwaters roaring down the canyon. And because of this, the canyon has changed, its wildlife has changed, the intricate tapestry of this remarkable ecosystem formed over millions of years, has been altered. The ecosystem had been altered so much that on this day, the third of what officials call a high flow experiment will take place. Secretary of the Interior, Dirk Kempthorne, head of the nation's principal conservation agency, will himself push the button to open the flood tubes from Glen Canyon Dam. Remember those ducks we showed you earlier enjoying the calm beauty of Glen Canyon? Well, here is how the flood looked to them. But don't worry, eventually they all flew away. Glen Canyon Dam, completed in 1963, forever changed the lower Colorado River, transforming it from a warm, muddy, unpredictable force of nature into a cooler, clearer, tightly controlled water delivery system. Without spring floods to flush the system and help rebuild beaches and fish habitat, native species suffered. The shift helped speed the extinction of four fish species and push two others, including the chub, to the edge. Well, I think that there's a certain amount of disturbance that the canyon depends upon. We've learned that through the various tests and studies that have been done over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. And in addition, those beaches, of course, are important to the people that float the canyon. And from what I understand, the backwaters are potentially important to the endangered fish because they go into that warmer, quieter water uh, to rear the young. But native fish like the chub aren't the only fish in the Colorado. Non-native rainbow trout were introduced as a sport fish shortly after the dam closed its gates. Arizona game fish continued to stock the trout population until they became self-sustaining, which meant they were spawning in the river on their own accord. Uh, they continued that stocking program up until 1998, when the amount of wild spawn trout in the river were actually close to 100%. They were stocked into the upper reaches of the river, between the dam and Lee's Ferry, about a 15-mile stretch that has become one of the premier trout fishing destinations in the country. Worries that the artificial flood would negatively affect the trout seem to be unfounded. Steve Hamm and his group were on the river just two weeks after the flood. We were told about the release uh, at the dam before we came, but uh, we were told by the guides that uh, we had a good chance of still having some really good fishing, and that proved to be uh, absolutely true. It was just fabulous. It really crescendoed today for me. I, I caught 15 fish, my partner 16 fish. We probably had... Uh, you know, 10, 10 to 12 long distance releases. The Arizona Game and Fish Department has been monitoring the trout since the early 1980s. They regularly spend several nights on the river to check on the condition of the fish. Part of our long-term monitoring up here is that we, we do electrofish um, the trout at the ferry. And what we're gonna be doing is uh, kind of electrofishing for a piece of, uh, a selected piece of habitat for instance, a cobble bar, and we're going to net the fish, we're going to work them up, and we're also going to be tagging and weighing these fish. Three, four, one. So with hopes that we could get a better, better population estimates and better estimates of growth and etc. The electro fishing process allows the biologists to stun the fish long enough for them to complete their work, and then they are released back into the river. Even though the process sounds harsh, it doesn't harm the fish. On our boats, we've got a generator, a 5,000 watt generator, and a magic box called a 
CPS, a complex pulse system electrofishing unit. And what that box does is it takes the AC power from the generator and converts it into a pulsed DC electrofishing current. And we've got anodes off the front of the boat and cathodes off the back. So essentially what we have is one 16-foot electricity circuit. And when we do pass it in the water, it gets distributed throughout the water and depending on your shoreline type and on, depending on the substrate, um, now the current gets bounced off the rocks, off the sand, and passes through the fish to where the point they become stunned, come up to the water and where they're there for us to net. It will take about a month to completely analyze the data that Andy Rainbow. and his crew have gathered here tonight. But already, he is seeing some right. positive indicators. Well, we're kind of seeing similar results that, uh, without analyzing the data and kind of offhand, that look fairly similar to the results that we observed in, uh, before the flood in February. And what we're seeing with the fish is that they're looking fat and happy, um, real healthy looking. The controlled flood released 41,000 cubic feet per second of water for 60 hours, which scientists hope will be enough to create the desired effect of a natural spring flood. Of course, this release is being looked at and weighed and measured for much more than its possible effect on the rainbow trout fishery at Lee's Ferry. Today's test involves over 100 scientists along 225 miles of river. These scientists come not only from the USGS and other federal agencies, but from leading research uh, universities around the world. I am excited that the research that will take place in conjunction with the high flow test is being conducted using an ecosystems based approach. In order to understand the ecosystem, we must understand the linkage between physical processes, such as the movement of sand, and biological community that exists within the Grand Canyon. In 1992, Congress passed the Grand Canyon Protection Act, which ordered the Department of the Interior to manage the dam in a way that better protected resources. Four years later, the government staged the first artificial flood. A second high flow test was conducted in 2004. Since the original purpose of Glen Canyon Dam was water storage, hydroelectrical generation, and flood control, the agencies that are charged with these different areas are often at odds with one another. There's a somewhat of a continual tension between the work that the Bureau of Reclamation has to do in operating the facility and that the other federal agencies have relative to the downstream resources. As, as our commissioner said, Congress has established the Colorado River Storage Project and established Glen Canyon Dam and given us direction on what we're to do and the benefits we're to achieve. Downstream of the dam, Congress has also created Grand Canyon National Park. Congress has said we will do certain things to protect environmental values downstream. So there, there is a, a tension that continually is at play. And part of what we're trying to do through the adaptive management program is find some of that middle ground, find the ways that we can maintain and protect the benefit of the dam and maintain and protect the, the resources that are downstream. Glen Canyon Dam's mighty generators turn out 4.5 billion kilowatts of power for the southwest every year. And Lake Powell, when full, can hold 27 million acre feet of water. The lake has also become a major recreation destination for visitors. But how the dam will be managed in the future, and should regular flooding of the Grand Canyon become part of its mission, is still not certain.